Life Rescue and I'm so excited for us to take you on a little journey through our wildlife center so we can teach you all of the really cool things that we do here as well as see some of our awesome animal friends that live here. As we meet our different animal friends today, we're also going to talk a little bit about the different types of diets that they have. Just like every animal is different, every animal has different teeth and they eat different things. But we can tell a lot about animals just by looking at their teeth. So we're going to look at these three skulls as an example of some different diets that animals in Ontario have. This first skull we see right here is an animal who would be a herbivore. And I know this because we can see that they have all these flat molars in the back that have lots of ridges for grinding up their rough food. They have to do a lot of chewing. They eat things that are really tough. Plants are made of cellulose and cellulose is really hard for an animal's body to break down. So they have to do a lot of that breaking down right in their mouth. That's why their teeth have all these different ridges meant for breaking down those different parts of plants. But this herbivore also has these really cool front incisors. They have these sharp front incisors meant for snipping off or chewing different parts of plants. But I'm not going to tell you why they're orange just yet because that will ruin one of the surprises that we're going to talk about a little bit later. This skull right here is a type of animal that lives right at the wildlife center. This animal is known for climbing trees and having a really special spiky defense. This skull is from a North American porcupine. So we'll check back in in a little bit and talk about those big orange teeth that you can see right in the front. A lot of people think of beavers when they see those teeth, but it's not just beavers that have big teeth like that. So we will see just why they're orange when we go actually meet one of our porcupine friends that live here at the center. This next skull, a lot of people think that this is a big carnivore in Ontario. They think it's a big mean predator, but it's actually an animal who eats both meat and plants. They don't eat just meat. They don't prey upon other animals that often. This animal, if we look, have molars in the back that are ridged and bumpy, kind of almost even looking like our molars. They have these big canine teeth in the front and they would have front incisors as well if the skull wasn't well loved. But these big canine teeth don't mean that this animal is a big predator. Canine teeth are meant more for holding the prey still than anything else. So they have those teeth for holding things down, but they don't actually use them for consuming their food as much as we think they do. If we look at these teeth, they are very similar to the teeth that we have in our own body, our own human skull. And what do humans eat? Well, we eat basically anything, or we can eat basically anything. So just like this bear, yeah, this big skull is from a bear. Humans and bears are able to eat different things, and we call that being an omnivore. You can eat both meat and plants. You have teeth to be able to eat both, and that is what we see here. And this last skull I want to show you is from an animal who is a true carnivore. They have sharp teeth through their whole mouth. If we look at their molars, they're shaped like triangles and they act actually like scissors when this animal is eating. We call these carnassial teeth. They help the animal shred their food so they're able to eat really, really quickly because predators, they have a lot of competition for their food and it takes them a long time to be able to catch something to eat. So they want to eat as much of it as quickly as possible before someone else tries to come and steal it from them. So they want to be able to shred their food really quick and swallow it. These guys tend to eat in chunks. They tend not to chew, chew, chew their food like animals who eat plants. So that's why they have these sharp triangle-like teeth as their molars. And this skull is actually a cat skull. And I will get to see a cat species here at the Wildlife Center. Just hold tight, stick with me, and I'll show you someone really cool towards the end of my little presentation for you. 
but they have sharp canines in the front for holding down their prey. Just small incisors. They use them to rip some stuff off of their prey sometimes. But the big focus of these guys are those sharp carnassial teeth at the back meant for shredding their food. So that is the examples of some different diets we're going to see while we're here at the center today. And we'll get to see some animals that eat those diets as well. This is my friend Vinny, the North American porcupine. Vinny's been here since he was just a little guy. And now that he's nice and big, he lives in this awesome outdoor enclosure that even has a live apple tree in it for him to be able to climb and chew on. Because porcupines would spend up to 90% of their life in the trees in the wild anyway. Now they do live in the trees and they are a herbivore and they actually have some special adaptations for this. He's got nice long claws to be able to grip that tree when he's climbing up and down and he even has special teeth meant for being able to chew on bark and different parts of trees. His front teeth are orange, that's so strange. And it's not because he eats too many carrots or he doesn't brush his teeth. He has a special layer of iron on the front of his teeth that make them really hard so he can chew on things like tree bark. If we chewed on trees with our teeth, we would break them off and it would hurt so much. But these guys are meant for living their life in the tree and for eating parts of trees as well as other plants too. Now Vinny here, a lot of people are scared because of their quills. They think that porcupines shoot their quills, pew, 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 everywhere. But they aren't able to shoot their quills. Porcupine quills are part of their body. They're in their skin. It's just like our hair. And they only fall out when you actually push on their quills if they're puffed up, really scared, trying to protect themselves. And then every now and then an old quill will fall out, just like our hair sheds when it's a little bit old as well but their quills don't just shoot out and attack things. You actually have to touch that porcupine for him to lose his quills. This is Mary Hoppins, one of the domestic rabbits who call Soper Creek Wildlife Rescue their home. Typically, we don't accept domestic animals at the wildlife rescue. However, Mary was a special case and she did come to us from one of our wild family members. Mary was found outside in the winter time and that's no place for domestic rabbit to be. Domestic rabbits are very different from our wild rabbits who call Ontario home, as they only have one layer of fur versus the two that wild rabbits would have. Being outside in the winter would have caused Mary all kinds of problems, potentially even being fatal. So we are more than happy to welcome, in, welcome her here until she was able to find a permanent home. However, after spending the weekend with her, we decided she would be a great addition to our wild family as wild cottontail rabbits are not able to be used as educational animals. They wouldn't accept it and they wouldn't like it and it wouldn't be fair to them. Cottontail rabbits are the common kind of rabbit to find in this area of Ontario. However, we do also have snowshoe hare as well. Snowshoe hare are a little bit different as they do change color with the season, where cottontail rabbits stay the same color all year. This is Mary's friend Pikachu, a rescue from another facility, as bunnies like to live together, and we wanted to make sure that Mary had a partner to be able to live with. And even though he looks more like a natural coloration of a rabbit, Pikachu is also a domestic species as well. So these guys live a nice fun life outside in the summertime and we make sure they're well taken care of in an indoor enclosure in the winter time. Is this a baby beaver? No, this is Alan the groundhog. Commonly thought to be a baby beaver, but there's a few things that are a little bit different. Alan doesn't have that waterproof fur that a beaver would have. A beaver would have brown glossy fur all over their body making them able to swim underwater but still stay dry when they come out. And Alan has this fluffy corn broom like tail, not a big hard paddle like a beaver would have. Now I do call his tail a big corn broom because that's what he uses it for. Groundhogs, when they build their big long tunnels underground, actually sweep their tunnel every time that they go through it, keeping it nice and clean so they're able to travel around really easily. 
Now, Alan had a little bit of a sad start to his life. Somebody thought that Alan would be able to be a really good pet. They decided to go out, find some baby groundhogs, and bring them home to keep them like a hamster. And they were feeding him hamster food. But hamster food is not groundhog food, and it didn't have the right nutrients in it for him to be able to grow up big and strong. He was so deprived that he started eating his own hair to try and stay healthy. And when we got him here at Silver Creek, he was actually bald except for the couple patches on top of his head that he couldn't reach. We had to cover him in citrus oil for months to get him to stop chewing on his fur because groundhogs don't like citrus. And once he learned that he had all the nutrients he needed in all of his delicious food here, his fur did start to grow back. Welcome to our brand new enclosure built by our amazing team of volunteers. This enclosure is 40 feet long and 20 feet high who might live in here? Let's find out. If you guessed an owl, you are right. This is Echo, the great horned owl, and he's so happy to live in his brand new home. There's lots of features in here that are built specifically for him and his lifestyle that he loves to live. He's got lots of different perches and different <laughs> textures, sizes of things to be able to stand on and fly to. And he's definitely having a fantastic time in his new wild space. What are you doing? What are you doing? It goes like this. Does this go up here? So this is Odin. He is our American crow, or one of our American crows here at the Wildlife Center. He has been here since about this time last year. He came in as a little fledgling, uh, but he had been attacked by a dog and his esophagus wasn't where it was supposed to be inside of his body anymore. So he had to have a massive surgery and we're very lucky that he's still here with us today. Now crows are highly intelligent, that's why Odin and I like to play games like stacking the rings because it helps keep him mentally entertained and works with all of his different abilities. See, Olaf is coming in for some fun as well. Olaf says, why is this ring on the ground? I don't know, Olaf. Want to down here? Is that the right order? Is that right? Do you think so? How about this? What is this? Are you so concerned? What if I put this up here? How does that make you feel? So you can see crows are extremely intelligent and when they're used to being around people, they definitely know how to interact and socialize. Here at the Wildlife Center, we have to play games too. Things such as animal scat can actually give us a lot of clues about animals. It can show us if they're eating the proper nutrition, if their body is acting properly and working well, and it can tell us what kind of species it is. So if we look around on our table here, I know that these animals right here are animals who are plant eaters because they all tend to form these different kind of pellets. Whereas if you transition into eating meat as well as fruits and vegetables, you're gonna start to have scat that looks a little bit more like this. A little bit more like maybe your pet dog or cat or maybe even yourself. This is Pedro, the awesome opossum. Pedro came to us for a very special reason. If we look deep into his eyes, oh wait, you can't, because he was born without them. Pedro is completely blind, born without any eyeballs, meaning that he definitely wouldn't be able to survive on his own in the wild. Now he does have a great sense of smell, and those whiskers give him a pretty good sense of feel, but he still doesn't know exactly where he's going all of the time. 
He came to us from another center once it was discovered his genetic condition that he was born with. Now, opossums, they are pretty awesome. Even though they're not originally from Ontario, they make a really good member to our ecosystem. They're great pest controllers, helping control the populations of ticks and other creatures that we don't always like to have in our own backyards. So having an opossum nearby is actually probably pretty lucky and will help you enjoy your wild space even a little bit more. This is our American Badger, Khaleesi. Khaleesi is a rescue from the United States and we're super happy to have her here at Soper Creek. American badgers are a native species to Ontario. However, they are extremely endangered in our province. There's only a very small breeding population left within our province, making her one of the endangered species that we now have here at Soper Creek. American badgers, even though they look kind of like a big fluffy pancake, are extremely strong and they have these really long claws meant for digging. They build a humongous tunnel system underground that they're able to use for hiding and sleeping, as well as they're able to dig tunnels for hunting different prey species. This is Edwin, my friend, the striped skunk. Striped skunks are the type of wild skunk we have in Ontario. You can tell they're striped skunk by the big stripes on their back. But just like how we all have different fingerprints and we're all unique, these guys all have their own fingerprint or their own set of unique stripes on their backs. No two skunks look the same, just like how our fingerprints are different or how no two snowflakes are the same. Sometimes it's one stripe, two stripes, it can be four stripes, it can be a white dot on their head. They're all very different. Now skunks, they don't actually want to spray people, even though they have that smelly reputation. That's how they're able to protect themselves from things that are scaring them. So you'll often see them doing some funny dance moves, like stomping their feet, waving their tail, or even this little scoot that they do. But those are signs that they're scared, and if nothing changes, they will try to protect themselves with their spray but they only have a little bit of spray inside of their body. And once they use it, it can be two weeks until they're able to spray again. So they wanna make sure that they only use it when they absolutely have to. So if you see a skunk doing their funny dance moves, walk away nice and quietly, and they're gonna save that, that spray for something a little scarier. This is Freddie, the Arctic Fox. One of two Arctic Foxes that call Soper Creek Wildlife Rescue their home. Now, Arctic Foxes are a little bit different than Red Foxes in multiple different ways. Arctic Foxes are much smaller in general than a Red Fox ever will be. But they also have some adaptations on their body for surviving life in the Arctic. Being small means that all their heat and body parts are compacted closer together in their body. They have shorter ears to prevent their ears from getting frostbite, and they have really thick fluffy tails to keep themselves nice and warm. They're able to wrap themselves up like a scarf. Arctic foxes also change color with the seasons. They're experts at camouflage, being a whitish color in the winter time and a darker gray color in the summer in order to blend in with their surroundings in the Arctic, as it's not snowy there all year. It does get pretty rocky at times as well. Arctic foxes make different sounds than red foxes, and oftentimes we almost hear our friend JT sounding a little bit like a monkey. Here we are in our enclosure for our silver fox family. Now, I say silver foxes, that's kind of their nickname, and you'll see when we get to see them why we call them silver foxes. They're not the red color that we tend to think of when we think of foxes. So normally a red fox would have a fur color kind of similar to my hair color but in this situation we've switched so just like how my hair color is a little rare for humans the fur color of these guys is quite rare and quite different so many of our foxes in this family have black fur on their body which is very rare to see in the wild now as we move around in this enclosure you'll see that they're actually playing some games together Foxes play games when they're young to be able to learn and grow. 
many times you'll see them wrestling in sibling pairs or even in their whole pack of siblings and they even will wrestle with mom and dad biting at each other it teaches them just how much force that they are actually able to use they'll wrestle to build their strength and they'll even say different things to each other in their strange fox language to learn their communication so let's see if we can find a few of them playing their little fox games Well, it looks like our whole family is back here together. We've got six foxes who live in here together. But wrestling, you'll notice, are our two smallest that live in this enclosure. We had two babies born in this enclosure last year, Scarlet and Ruby. And they're playing with Ebony, still learning how to be that fox that they want to be as they grow up. Paintbrush, she was able to just play catch. She caught a bug out of midair and now she gets a little snack. Or maybe she'll just try to hunt it and bury it because they also like to do that. They play a little bit of hide and seek in this enclosure, taking treats, digging holes, and covering them up for later. Except later is uh, generally in a few seconds when someone else comes and steals it. This is Dakota, one of our resident foxes here at Silver Creek Wildlife Rescue. And even though he does look quite a bit different than our typical red fox, he is still uh, in the red fox family or a red fox species. Red foxes are able to come in all kinds of different color patterns, uh, such as Ash, who is behind him, and Dakota here. Dakota's coloration is often nicknamed a marble fox, but he is still a red fox with a bit of funny colored hair. Dakota was brought to us after being found running around in the community and confiscated by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry because he was wearing a collar. It is against the law in Ontario to have native species as your pet, and that meant Dakota had to find a new home where he was allowed to be living. And since we're licensed to have wild animals here at our facility, this was the perfect home for him. Unfortunately, when Dakota came to us, you could tell that his care wasn't up to the standard that we follow here. Dakota came to us with mange, ear mites, and broken teeth. And later we discovered he also has Lyme disease. We were able to take him to the vet clinic and get him fixed up and happy and healthy once again. And when he was ready, we introduced him to his new best friend, Ash. And they run around and play in their enclosure together all day. This is Fooey, uh, our coyote resident here at Silver Creek. Fooey came to us last year as a very young coyote who had been kept illegally in someone's home for about five weeks. Nutrition is extremely important when raising and taking care of animals, and Fooey wasn't getting the proper nutrition he needed in his life, as well as he wasn't being treated like a wild animal. And these things together have led to him being unable to be released back into the wild. When Fooey was only a few weeks old, he was actually being fed a diet of avocados, bananas, and goat's milk. Nothing like what a wild coyote would be raised on, as coyotes are primarily carnivores. This led to him having an enlarged stomach and deformed ears, as well as matted fur and a whole bunch of other problems when he came to us and because he was treated like a dog even just for a few weeks of his young life we haven't been able to turn him into that wild coyote that he should be but we do appreciate his presence here at silver creek and he definitely makes us smile and laugh uh, every day that he's here Coyotes are, have a little bit of a scared reputation in Ontario. People do not understand coyotes and are very scared to see them around. However, coyotes are not mean and scary, especially towards humans. They are just trying to live their wild lives. And the more we build and take over their wild spaces, the more that they are going to be found closer and closer to us because we're not leaving space for them to go hunt and play in. This enclosure is home to Skye and Todd, a pair of wolves who came to us this past winter after being confiscated from somebody who had them as pets. Just like any other species in Ontario, native species are illegal to hose as a pet inside of your home. 
If you have a native species and they need help, you have up to 24 hours to get them to a rehabilitation center. No native species is able to be a pet inside of your home. This enclosure is our largest enclosure and was definitely a labor of love to get ready for Sky and Todd, but we're so happy that they're here with us now. And now we're able to say that we have a whole bunch of different kinds of canine species that are native to Ontario. Sky and Todd are definitely very happy and healthy now that they're here at Silver Creek. And Todd's over there, even looks like he's smiling this morning. So these guys are a lot healthier than they were when they got here. They enjoy having all this space to roam around and play together. And they fit into our Silver Creek family very, very well. Hey, pretty girl. Okay, guys, this is my friend Floki the Canadian Lynx. Floki is just over a year old, and he can definitely have some pretty friendly moments. I can tell he's a Canadian Lynx by all kinds of different features on his body. He has these nice long tufts on top of his ears. He's got all kinds of cheek fur and he has these big snowshoe-like paws. And they're an adaptation that allows him to walk on top of the snow, especially when he's after his favorite prey, the snowshoe hare. A little bit different from a bobcat, lynx are about twice the size. They have a black tip to their tail where bobcats would have black and white stripes and his back legs are a lot longer than his front legs where bobcats are a little bit more even. And these guys are extremely fast, very good jumpers and climbers. They like to sit up in the trees and pounce down onto the prey below. So I'm here with Mario and Luigi, our New Guinea singing dogs, also known as dingoes. And these guys are super cool to get to see. There's only a few hundred of them worldwide. They were thought to be extinct in the wild until a few years ago when they found a small population. These guys are true carnivores. They have those carnassial teeth in their mouth. All their teeth are sharp and they work like scissors to slice their food. And these guys really enjoy chicken and other prey items that they're able to have here. Mario and Luigi are some of the only dogs who can actually turn their wrists. It makes them really good climbers. And they get the name Singing Dog because they definitely like to sing and sometimes they even sing with us although they'll probably make a fool out of me and not do it back right now you guys ready oh! Oh! I told you they always like to make me look so silly but I promise they do actually sing There are eight different kinds of turtles who call Ontario home. And this species of turtle is a painted turtle. And this is Charles. Charles is here because somebody was trying to keep him as a pet for many years. And they actually had taken him directly out of the wild and brought him home. And that's against the law in Ontario for all species. Doesn't matter what kind of species it is, if you can find it in Ontario, it is against the law to try to keep them in your home as a pet. But Charles was kept for many years in somebody's home and was fed a diet of ground beef. And that's not something he would be able to find out in the wild. Since he was small when he was taken from the wild and he had the improper diet, it means that if he was released out to the wild, he wouldn't know how to find his food and what kind of food he should be eating. So now he's calling Silver Creek his home. He lives in this pond with a couple other turtle friends. We have Wilbur, the red-eared slider, as well as Nebula, another painted turtle. But I want to talk about red-eared sliders for a second because they are a type of turtle 
that you can find in the pet stores in Ontario. You are allowed to have this turtle as a pet, but the problem is a lot of people don't know how much work having a pet turtle actually is. Turtles can live for over 30 years as a pet, and that's a big commitment. A lot of people don't realize how much water and space a turtle needs as well, and the fact that their tank needs to be cleaned all the time because they swim in it constantly, so the water gets dirty pretty quick. And unfortunately, a lot of people will release their pet turtles out into the wild, but this is not okay because this makes the red-eared slider become an invasive species. He starts taking food from different turtles in the wild as well as he takes over their habitat space. So this type of turtle is not supposed to be found in the wild in Ontario, but has methods that they are able to survive if they're released after being someone's pet. So they are becoming a problem in our wetlands and are causing issues for our native species of turtles, just like the painted turtle, like Nebula and Charles. Next time you're out for a drive, I want you to play I Spy and see if you can spy a turtle trying to cross the road. At this time of year, many turtles are crossing roads to find great places to lay their eggs. The problem is that there's a lot of cars around the roads. So be a really good animal steward and watch out for turtles when you're on a drive. Unfortunately, many turtles need to travel to lay their eggs. They spend most of their life around the water, but they actually lay their eggs in gravelly or sandy areas, which isn't always right where their habitat is found. So sometimes they do have to cross that road to find the perfect nesting site. So make sure you're watching out and look for these champions of hide and seek. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed your virtual tour and got to learn something. And maybe by this time next year, you'll actually get to come and visit us on property. We'd be so excited to get to see you. Thanks guys.